How many know there's a lot of shaky things happening in the earth today? How many know when we get around election time, and I'm not here to talk about politics, so don't get nervous. Some of y'all like that, like, come on, pastor, talk about politics, but I'm not here to talk about politics. But how you know, usually around an election cycle, things kind of get a little bit crazier. Have you noticed that, or is that just me, <laughs> or what? Things just begin to happen. Things begin to get a little bit crazier. And how many know there is a lot of shaky ground out there? There's a lot of shaky things that's happening, and the Bible actually, actually tells us that everything that can be shaken will be shaken. You know, we are, uh, we are in, a, in a world today with so much uncertainty when you look at current events and the things that are happening in the earth, uh, the things that are going on in the earth, the things that are going on in the medical community, and the rise of sickness and disease and uh, plagues and, and different things that are happening. There's a lot of shaky things that are happening and today I want to talk a little bit about being an un, unshakable Christian because a lot of Christians have been shaken and there are things in our life that need to be shaken off so that we can get back to Christ the solid rock I stand because all other ground is sinking sand. I mean, we have to get our feet on solid ground because there are so many things in this life that try to knock us off our firm foundation. And if we don't have a foundation in the Word, I'm going to say it again, if we don't have a foundation in the Word, when we go back and look throughout history and we look at what has happened over the last 40, 50 years of taking commandments off the walls and can't have Bibles in schools and all this kind of stuff, there's been a plan of the enemy to get us off of the one sure thing, and that's the Word of the living God. We live in a culture and a society today where it's old-fashioned to teach your children not to have sex before marriage. We live in a society today that you're looked at even in the church. Oh, they're just kids. They've got to explore and everything else. And we've gotten so far from the Word of God. And we wonder why our families are messed up. We wonder why our communities are messed up. We wonder why people shoot things up and blow things up. And, and people take their own life and everything else. is because we've gotten off of what this, even, this nation was founded upon. And that's the Word of the living God. And many times people come in emotionally into the kingdom of God. I'm not just talking about church. We can fill churches up but not have the presence and the authenticity of the kingdom of God. We can have a lot of programs and a lot of stuff and a lot of cool things but not have the authentic presence and power of God, Christ abiding in our hearts, in our homes, because when we don't abide in Him and He in us, when the things begin to shake in the earth, they try to knock us off our firm foundation. They try to talk us out of the Word of God. They try to talk us out of the promises of God and the plan of God. And many times we begin to walk by what we see instead of walking by faith in the Word of the living God. And I believe that we're living in a time that God is wanting to raise up His people. He's wanting to raise up churches that we are, we are firmly planted on a firm foundation, and that is the Word of the living God. God wants us to prosper the Bible says he wants to give us a hope. He wants to give us a future. That even in Ephesians, it says those he, he, he foreknew, those he, how many know he knew us before we were even in our mother's womb? He created us and formed us and fashioned us. He said, I've predestined them for good works. And a lot of times we choose a pathway of education. Thank you, Lord, for education. We choose a pathway to try to better ourselves. Thank you, Lord, that we want to try to better ourselves. But the only way... And the only foundation is the Word of God. It's being led by the Spirit of God. And so many Christians are unstable. God is wanting to stabilize us in an unstable society. God is wanting to stabilize a remnant of people that says, you know what? We don't want to just have uh, a cool things and cool gimmicks to try to get people to come to our church. We want the authentic, uh, the authentic, the auth the authentic presence and power of God that changes lives. It's so important in our life, and there are things that happen that try to shake us and get us away. And last week we were talking about dwelling in the secret place of God, dwelling under the shadow, abiding under the shadow of the Almighty. Because to walk in the, the blessings and the prosperity of the Lord, I want to say this, that the kingdom, God, the kingdom of God is never lacking. The economy may lack, the inflation may go nuts, things may be unstable in stock markets and all this kind of thing, but there is one thing that remains forever, and that's the kingdom that is unshakable. 
And God has called His people to be a part of a kingdom that is unshakable, that even though we're in the earth, God will provide every one of your needs according to His riches and glory by Christ Jesus. But you know what happens? There's a wave of media. There's a wave of, of, uh, of things that happen uh, through social media and the news media and the liberal media and, the, and the, the right wing and the left wing and all these kind of things. There's waves of things that happen to try to knock us off of the foundation of the Word of God. And what we need to do as the people of God is get our minds renewed to the Word of God and get back to what is important, and that's His Word and His presence. That's His Word and His presence. Why? Because He is an anchor that will hold in the storm. When you begin to understand, and I begin to understand and realize that the blood is enough, when the doctors don't tell you something that you want to hear, you realize that you have a word that's greater than any other word in the earth. There's a lot of shaking that's happening and a lot of shaking that's going on. And God wants us to not be unstable. He don't want us, to, want us to be full of instability, but He wants us to be planted firm. And I want to go to the book of Galatians this morning because we've got to be firm. If you were here a few weeks ago, Johnny Jernigan talked about being in the pool, being in the, in, in the pool, getting in the pool, that we have to make a conscious decision to get in the pool. We also have to make a conscious decision to get out of the pool. And sometimes, as we were talking about last week, life can throw you a curveball and it can knock you off of your foundation. It can knock you out of the pool and get you back in a place that's going to cause you to begin to spiral out of control. And we have, to, we have to come to grips and realize that no matter what happens in this life, we've got to stay in the pool. Pastor, what do you mean by the pool? I'm talking about the Spirit, staying in the Spirit, staying in the place that God created all of us to be in, and that is His presence. In Galatians chapter 5, verse 16, the Bible says this, I say then, walk in the Spirit. Somebody shout Spirit. Spirit. Walk in the Spirit. He says, I say then, walk in the Spirit, and you shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. How many know we all got the flesh? How many know some of us woke up in the flesh? Some of us got up on the wrong side of the bed. Yep, you ever heard that? Man, you got up on the wrong side of the bed. You just need to go back to bed. Get back up on the right side of the bed. And then we get in an argument. Why do you mean the wrong side of the bed? I'll kick you out of the bed. Said my wife, never. <laughs> I'll kick you out of the bed. He says, walk in the spirit and you shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. There are lusts of the flesh that try to pull us away from the prosperity and the blessing and the purpose of God for our life. There are enemies of destruction that come to kill, steal, and destroy. Jesus said it in John 10, 10, the thief cometh not to, but to kill, steal, and destroy. But I've come to give you life and life more abundantly. If your favorite person is leading, if they're singing your favorite song, no, he said, I come to give you life and life more abundantly no matter what. You don't need to get caught up in who's leading what, who's doing what, who's saying what. You need to get caught up in what I'm saying. So many times we get caught up what prophet so-and-so says, and my favorite pastor says on TV, and this and that. And thank God for every prophet and every man of God. But you know what? We need to walk in the Spirit because man can miss it. Books can get it wrong. Come on, somebody. But there is the Word of the Lord and the Spirit of God that will lead us us into all truth and we need that as individual Christians we need that in our families and our marriages and there's times in my life that I sit down with people and I don't I don't I, I give them the word of God but at the end of the day I tell them you've got to hear from God and you've got to make the decision that the Spirit of the Lord wants you to make but what we've done in the church is even pastors have puffed themselves up and said, look at my gift and look at my ability to hear from God. When every individual can hear from God. <laughs> every individual was created and formed and fashioned to hear from God. And there's so many lusts of the flesh that try to pull us away. But the writer was saying here to the church, he was saying, walk in the spirit so you shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. For the flesh lusts against the spirit and the spirit against the flesh. There is an internal war. Can I tell you something? We've given the devil way too much credit. We've given the devil way too much credit because he goes about, the Bible says in Peter, like a roaring lion. He's not a roaring lion. He goes about as a counterfeit, like a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. And Johnny didn't say it when he was here, but we traveled with him many years. 
He said, you know what? When the enemy goes about like a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour, he's, he's trying to see who he can devour, but he is a toothless pussycat. He, he, he has no teeth, and we've given the devil way too much credit when the real war is between our flesh and our spirit. And if we would learn to dwell in the spirit, if we would learn to live in the pool of his presence, if we would learn to say, you know what, I'm going to dwell in this place even when my flesh wants to punch you in the throat. Come on, nobody ever felt that? It's just like you getting on my nerves. You know, early in the morning, we got up and got our kids up and everything else. And uh, wife has to take a little more time. So dad's trying to make sure the kids are doing what they need to do. We're just kind of work as a team. And, you know, I told you last week that God had been dealing with me this thing of honor. And we're actually going to get there. We're going to talk about honor and the importance of honor and the key of honor in our life. The code of the kingdom is, a, is honor and how to honor people that seem unhonorable and, 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 and how to walk in respect. We're going to talk about honor in marriage. I'm not going to tell you wins because I want you to come. <laughs> you know, I'm going to talk about how we honor each other in marriage and all that kind of thing, at least I think. But late last night, I felt the Lord shift in this sermon. So this morning, I, was, I just had things, and I was trying to help the kids, and they were making their own bowl of cereal, so we didn't, have to, we didn't have to cook or anything like that. But I'm sitting at the kitchen table, and I've got my daughter over here, and I've got my son over here, and I'm sitting at the head of the table, and I've got my Bible, and I've got my iPad, and I'm just feeling the Lord speaking to me some scriptures that he wants me to share and some things that he wants to talk about today. And you know, early in the morning, the house is real quiet. And it just seems like your ears are more sensitive early in the morning. I, I don't know about you, but for me, it does. And man, they are sitting there smacking and slurping cereal. And I am trying to hear from God and being in the flesh at the same time. <laughs> and I'm like, I'm getting all up in the flesh. And you know what? A lot of times, there is a, there is a war that the Bible is telling us that's between the flesh and the spirit. And we've got to learn to put the flesh under to stay in the spirit because in the spirit is where the presence and the blessings of the Lord are. It's, it, it's where all things are made new. So, so we give the devil way too much credit when the devil has been defeated. People say, well, the devil's on my back. Well, the devil shouldn't be on your back. The devil should be under your feet according to the Word of God. And when you feel like the devil is on your back, you've got to realize that, you know what? I'm stepping out of my flesh. I'm going to get in the Spirit, and I'm going to put on the garment of praise, a spiritual weapon that God has given me, and I'm going to get the devil off my back. I'm going to get him out of my marriage. Listen, he can't stay in your home. He can't stay in your marriage. He can't stay unless we allow him to. And we've given the devil way too much credit because the Bible even tells us, Jesus said, Behold, I've given you authority. I've given you authority. Can I tell you something? Somebody might have told you you'll never reach this or you'll never do this or you'll never do that. And you've had too much sin in your life and you've went through a divorce and you've did this and you've done that. You know what? Shut up, devil. Because we are the children of God, and nobody's perfect, and if you went through a divorce, God will still use you if you get your heart right. Come on now. God will still use you to do exceedingly abundantly above all you could ever ask or think or imagine. But we've given the devil too much credit. We've allowed, we've allowed people to tell us the devil's this and the devil's that. But Jesus said, I've given you authority. I've given you authority to trample on serpents and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy. He is defeated. I wish somebody got happy about that. He is, he is really defeated. But there is this flesh that we deal with. For the flesh lust against the spirit and the spirit against the flesh, these are contrary to one another, so that you do not do the things that you wish. But if you are led by the spirit, you are not under the law, nor the works of the flesh. Now the works of the flesh are evident, which are adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lewdness, idolatry, sorcery, all the things that we embrace in the world today. All the things that the world embraces today, murders, envy, drunkenness, all these things that he says, and the like of which I tell you beforehand, so that I also told you in time past that these who practice such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. Those who practice the works of the flesh, those who 
continue to live in the works of the flesh, to continue to live in the flesh. What is the flesh? It is, it is the carnal man. It's the unrenewed mind. The Bible says in the book of Romans, to be fleshly, carnally minded is death, but to be spiritually minded is life and peace. You know, we know the works of the flesh, as he's already stated us here, stated in the word here, we, we see and know the works of the flesh. And you know what's crazy? Most Christians are known for what they're against instead of what they're for. We've all sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. And it's amazing how we want to tell people how bad they are. It's amazing how we want to tell people. People already know how bad they are. I already know how bad I am before somebody tells me. <laughs> you, you, you know what I'm saying? But as Christians, we, we want to we wanna, we wanna shout, you know, you're bad because of this, and you're bad because of that, and you shouldn't do this, and you shouldn't do that. But it's the goodness of God that leads me into repentance. It's the goodness of God that will cause us to want to get in the pool. That we can get in the pool with our bad attitude. We can get in the pool with our bad habit. We can come boldly to the throne of grace to obtain mercy. And if we will stay there long enough, you know what? Chains will begin to break off of us. The vices of the flesh will begin to loose their grip. Why? Because the goodness of God captures our heart that we don't want anything else. If there ever was a time that the heart of the church needs to be captured by the king, it is now. We want to get captured by good preaching. We want to get captured by good facilities. We want to get captured by good programs. We want to get captured by good. But many times, good is the enemy of great. There was an entire book written about that. And the only great one is God, Jehovah, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And we need to be captured by the great one because when our hearts are captured by him, giving's not an issue. Serving's not an issue. Showing up for church, even if it's raining, is not an issue. If you're online, we love you. We're glad you're online this morning. If you ain't watching and you come back later and you just slept in and you're being lazy, that's between you and the Lord. But anyway, I'm not salty about that, am I? The goodness of God capturing the heart of His people and he says, these are the works of the flesh. These things are evident. But he says this, but the fruit of the Spirit is love, it's joy, it's peace. A lot of times we think if we have more money, then we'll have a little bit more peace. And I've said this because Dave Ramsey said this. I don't know if you know Dave Ramsey, you may hate him or love him. But he says, listen, money is fun if you got any. It's the love of money that's the root of all evil. And a lot of times we think fleshly things will bring us love, joy, peace. We think relationships. And God puts us in relationships, and relationships are important. Don't hear me wrong, but we think these things. But no, he says the fruit of the Spirit, of walking in the Spirit, of getting in the Spirit, learning how. Do you know the average Christian don't even know how to engage in spiritual things? As a pastor, that, that, that bothers me. That bothers me a little bit. Why? Because in your home, you need to know how to bring the presence of the Lord in your home. In your marriage, you need to know how to engage and get in the Spirit. You need to, you need to learn that, you know what, that, that church is not just something to ease my conscience or my mind. Know that we are disciples and sons and daughters of God, that we can have His presence in our car, on our job, on the ladder when we're painting a house, whatever we're doing. He is with us everywhere we go, but we've got to make a conscious decision that we're going to dwell in His presence, we're going to walk in the Spirit, and we're going to resist the things of the flesh. Because he says this, that true love, everybody wants to be loved. Everybody wants joy. Everybody wants peace. He says long-suffering, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. These are things that the Spirit of God empowers us when we walk in the Spirit. What would happen if Christians in Habersham County would begin to walk in the Spirit? Walk in the Spirit. What if, what if Christians and pastors and leaders in Habersham County would begin to walk in the Spirit? But most people don't want nothing to do with the church. The church is not brick and mortar. The church is you and I. Most people don't want to have anything to do with the organization of church. Most people, most people are, that's old-fashioned, and you're just going to give me a bunch of rules and everything else. But it is life. The kingdom is life. And we try to find life in every other place and every other thing. 
But he says, listen, there is self-control, there is love, there is joy, there is peace. It's where? It's in the Spirit. It's when we choose and make a conscious decision that we're going to grow in the Spirit. That we're going to engage in spiritual things, not just once a week. Not just once a week, because that don't cut it. We need Him every hour of every day of our life. So my wife, I'm going to go ahead and tell you, I had to put my flesh under. I can't stand this shirt, but she likes this shirt. <laughs> She's like, please wear my favorite shirt. <laughs> I'm like, I don't want to wear this shirt. She's like, but it's my favorite shirt. I said, it's like 19, I don't know, 70 or something. That's just my mind. That's just how I think. So I'm like, okay, I'm going to walk in the spirit. I'm going to honor my wife. Request to wear this shirt. But I did get a little fleshly about it, but not too bad. So I'm just making a point. Even as a pastor, we all get a little flesh. There's always a war. But whenever I chose to walk in the Spirit, we had a nice ride to church this morning. <laughs> y'all act all holy like y'all don't get in a fight before church. <laughs> you get upset with each other before church. Why? Because the enemy's wanting to get you out of the place of his presence. He'll use anything to divide your, your, your family. He'll use anything to divide you from your pastor. He'll use anything to divide you from whoever he can divide you from. Why? Because he wants to divide. He wants to divide relationships. And when we don't walk in prosperity and when we don't walk in blessing, uh, we, 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 become, we become in this place of instability in our life. And God wants to, wants to stabilize us in the spirit realm. He wants to stabilize us in walking in the Spirit. And the only way to do that is to, begin to, is to begin to dwell in that pool of His presence, to begin to dwell in the Spirit, to begin to consciously every day do the things necessary to walk in the Spirit and not fulfill the lust of the flesh. Because the lust of the flesh are warring against the Spirit. Prosperity and blessings are not in your ability. Prosperity and blessings are not in your education. Thank the Lord for your ability. Thank God for education. Prosperity and blessings are not necessarily in the people you know and the people you hang with. God will put right people in your life. You need to pray for the right people in your life. You need to pray that the wrong ones don't come into your life. It's very important. It is important. But prosperity and blessings are not based on the economy. They're not based on who's running the nation. They're not based on the stock market. Prosperity and blessings are in salvation. They're in salvation. They're in salvation. They're in the spirit. They're in the kingdom realm of God. And we blame. Listen. I've been, a, I've been a victim of this my, in my own life. We blame the results of our life many times on everybody else but ourselves. Do you know that's a plan of the enemy to get you out of the Spirit of God? Because in the Spirit of God, there is everything that pertains to life and godliness. Oh, he's provided it all. He's given it all to us. But it's not over here in my flesh. It's not over here in my griping and complaining. It's not over here in my murmuring because of this and that. It's not in this because so-and-so did this and so-and-so stole that and so-and-so treated me a certain way and my boss didn't do this and my high school teacher didn't do that. Many times we get, we get over here in the flesh of the griping and complaining when Jesus has already made a way and we don't always get to choose what we go through, but we get to choose how how we go through it. And if we're in the midst of things that we feel like we're at a disadvantage because my mama left me and my daddy left me and I was an orphan, well, when your mama and daddy leave you, the Bible says he will take you in as his own, that we're no longer orphans anymore. We are sons and daughters of God. And I'm here to tell you that when we begin to learn to step out of this fleshly realm and begin to get in the pool of his presence and begin to walk in the spirit, my father who is in heaven owns the cattle on 
on a thousand hills, and he owns all the hills, and he gives good gifts unto his children. And so many times we're laboring over here in our flesh. We are unstable in all of our ways because we get off the foundation of the word of truth and the word of life, and we allow the things and the winds of doctrines of men and the things that are happening in the earth knock us off of our firm foundation, and we are over here striving in the flesh to try to make things happen. When God isn't wanting us to make things happen, He's wanting us to get in His presence and be obedient to His Word. And He said, if you are willing and obedient, in Isaiah 119, you will eat the good of the land. See, honestly, the Christian is called to be the head and not the tail, above only and not beneath. But we don't believe that in our society anymore. We don't believe that in the kingdom of God. Any, we don't believe that in the church anymore. Why? Because the church has become more like the world instead of like the kingdom. We put our faith more in what's happening around us instead of what's happening in the word and the spirit that God has released on us, in us, and in the earth. We don't always get to choose what we go through, but we get to choose how we go through it. And I'm here to tell you, God's for the underdog. God's for the underdog. Some of you might have been kicked out of a church before. Some of you might have, some of you might have been in ministry, and now something happened in your life, and, and you got on a wrong path, and, and you've been told, and you, told you disqualified for ministry. But I'm here to tell you that God will restore you and redeem you just like he did Peter. When Peter denied him, he came back to him and restored him. And God is a God of restoration, but that restoration comes when you begin to walk in the Spirit on the firm foundation of his word. Because it is He who gives you identity. It is He who will lead you forward. It is He that if we will stay stable. But you know what happens? Many times people, people run, Christians, church goers, they begin, to, they begin to run. They're here and there. They're up and down. They're high and low. And listen, there are valleys. There are peaks. There are mountaintops. But one thing you've got to do is you've, get never, you've got to never leave the firm foundation, the pool of His presence, the Word of God, walking in the Spirit and saying, my flesh is not going to have the best of me. The world is not going to have the best of me. Why? Because I'm a chosen people. I'm a royal priesthood. I'm God's very own special people according to the book of Peter. You got to settle that in your mind, in your heart. We blame, we blame why we're not here, why we're not there on so many others. When God says it doesn't matter, you just get in the pool. I'll make all things new. Oh, the, the, the years that the caterpillar and the canker worm have eaten, I will redeem the time. I will restore all things. God doesn't want his people oppressed. He wants us full of life and full of joy. And the only way to have life and joy is we've got to learn to dwell in the pool of his presence. We've got to learn to dwell in the secret place. We've got to learn to dwell in the word of God. Because when we do... When we get in the pool and stay in the pool, it is the key to victory. It is, the key of, it is the key to victory in your life. Victory over the enemy, victory over sin, victory over your past, victory over, over the depression, victory over the heaviness. Well, pastor, how long is it going to take? I, I dip my toe in the pool. Well, you got to put your foot in. you got to get your ankle in. Some of y'all need to be immersed and baptized in the pool. Some of you need to learn to just hold your breath and get in the waters of the river of the Lord. Some of, us, you, some of you need to dive in head first. Some of you need to just let go and say, you know what? It don't matter about the chain and the bondage and all this other stuff. I'm diving in the pool. I'm going in head first, all in. So many Christians today are in and out. I'm like, man, where you been? I hope you've been in the Bible. I know you don't have to go to church to be a Christian, but I, I hope you've been in the Word. I hope you've been in the presence of the Lord. Well, actually, Pastor, things just got tough, and things were just busy, and everything else, and yada, yada, yada. And I'm, I'm just thinking, how did that work out? You needed the strength of other people. You needed to be in a corporate setting and an anointing that would help break things off of you. Listen, as a pastor, I can't survive on my own and by myself. Just because I've been to Bible school and I've been preaching for whatever, how many years I've been preaching and everything else, I need your supply of the Spirit. I need your prayers. That's why this house is a spiritual house. It's a, it's a house of relationship and family. 
It's a, it's a house where, 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 where we don't judge people because of what they look like or the color of their skin or if they got a tattoo or if they wear a hat or even if they hadn't been here for about six or seven weeks. Come on back in. Where you been? Hey, come on. Because why? Because we need each other. We need the corporate anointing to break things off of our life that try to get us out of the presence, that try to get us out of the spirit, that try to get us out of the pool. I believe the enemy tried to use COVID to flee the church, spread the church, and cause the church to separate and everything else. And the fear that just come, man, I might get COVID. What if you got healed? We, we, we think fleshly. Are you hearing me? We think fleshly. Well, brother, you just never know. Come on, I've been guilty of saying that in my life before, but you better know what the Word of God says because the enemy will come to try to kill, steal, and destroy. And if you're like, brother, I just guess I, you just never know what's going to happen in the earth. And that's the truth. You just never know what's going to happen in the earth, but I know what happens according to the Word of God, that the weapon may be formed, but it won't prosper. That if I get something going on in my life, in my finances, I'm going to do what Pastor Eric and Nicole did. I'm going to get on my face before the Lord, hear the word of the Lord, and I'm going to make the adjustment that God says to make, and it don't matter what happens to the court converter. It don't matter what happens in the economy. God is always going to take care of his people. Why? Because we're not over here in the flesh trying to do it on our own, in our own education, in our own ability. We are in the spirit of God. We are in the secret place, and the Bible says that when we are in the secret place, we abide under the shadow of the Almighty, and when we abide under the shadow of the Almighty, Psalms 91 says, Hey, a thousand may fall at one side, ten thousand at your right side, but none shall come up on you, church. None shall come up on you. It's the blessing of the Lord, and the blessing of the Lord is in the pool of His presence. It's dwelling there. It's staying there. It's remaining there. We can't visit it on a Sunday once a month. We can't visit it every now and then we got to carry the glory on the inside of us. we got to let the glory come up on us. we got to learn to live and flow and walk in the Spirit. we got to realize that religion has tried to plague this entire community. It's tried to plague the minds of individuals of this community. Why? Because I was born and raised in Hollywood, Georgia. And I know the mindset that I used to have. I know the mindset of poverty, the things that crippled me, the things that I just thought, well, maybe God will bless me, and I don't know if God will bless me because I don't know enough Scripture, and I'm not, I'm not like so-and-so, and I grew up in a single wide trailer or whatever it may be. All these things that the religion of poverty puts on us when God wants to bless us if we would just get caught up in His presence and His Spirit. And there is, a, there is a mindset that's, well, you, you just never know. I guess I'm going to catch a cold. It's cold season. Well, the Bible says that we don't have to catch a cold. Well, I didn't see where it said actual cold, but I believe that sickness and disease, cold could come up under that thing. Well, Pastor, don't you get a headache sometimes? Yeah, I do. It's mostly because of sheep. No, I'm just kidding. Sheep by hurt, man. They hurt. It's like, what I do? I'm just trying to preach the word. I didn't make this stuff up. The weapons are formed, but you know how they prosper? When we start giving life to them with our words. Well, that's just how it is right now. Numbers are up and this and that and everything else. You know what I mean? And all this stuff touches us. It tries to touch our life. And it doesn't mean that if you get touched by something that you're not holy and you're not doing what you need to do. It, it doesn't mean that you're in some kind of sin. What it means is God has a plan and a destiny and a purpose for your life. And what you got to do is get over here in the spirit even when you're feeling cruddy. You know what I'm talking about? When your flesh is just feeling cruddy and you just need to shut the world off and that's okay. Lay on the couch for the day. Let your better half bring you some soup or some stew or some Zaxby's or whatever you got the hankering for or whatever you want to eat. And you just, you just sit there, but you gotta, you got to stay in the presence of the Lord declaring the word of God that this thing shall not prosper. Lord, you said that no weapon formed against me shall prosper. 
And even in your marriage, you know, when you start iron sharpening iron and, and, and things begin to happen and she's just getting on your nerves and he's just getting on your nerves and everything else, you got to take a minute and realize that, you know what, I'm not wrestling against flesh and blood right here. I need to get out of my flesh and out of my feelings and out of my emotions and I need to get in the spirit. And I need to say, come on, woman, I know you don't want to right now. You better be careful saying that. You might get punched in the eye. You know what I'm talking about? You just lead the way and you get in the presence of the Lord and you have have some self-control and you let love flow because love covers a multitude of sin and the Bible says a soft answer will turn away wrath. We're going to talk about that later, but anyway, what do you do when you when you feel fleshy and cruddy and things are happening in your marriage and the enemy you got to realize that we're not wrestling against flesh and blood and 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 people say that you know what well maybe it's not going to work and you can just do this and that no we're going to make it work because we're going to get in the spirit of God and I'm going to get on I'm going to get on God's page and you're going to get on God's page and when we get on God's page instead of my page or your page the blessing of God and healing will flow but what do we do? We just run and flee. We just give up and give in. Listen, I know there's cases where it's time to go. I don't promote divorce or anything else. We ain't talking about divorce today. or I guess we are, but anyway, <laughs> there's some circumstances that you, you have to go. I mean, I've worked with people in domestic violence and things, and it's like you got to go. You got to... You, you, you got to you got to put yourself, you got to put your situation in the place that you need to put it. But it's getting in the presence of the Lord. It's dwelling there in the presence of the Lord. Last week we talked about Psalms 91, 1 and 2. It says, he who dwells. He who what? He who what? He who dwells. i got to hurry. I never have enough time. I never have enough time. I'm just too long-winded. Thought I'd get an amen. Hallelujah. I just never have enough time. If you agree, say amen. <laughs> Psalms 91, verse 1 and 2, it says, He who dwells in where? The secret place of the Most High. He shall abide where? Under the shadow of the Almighty. He says, I will save the Lord. He is my refuge and my fortress. My God in Him I will trust. And that's what happens many times. When we get knocked out of the pool, we start putting our trust we start putting our trust. Thank God for medication. Don't hear me wrong. I am not anti-doctor. I am not anti-medication. I don't never want to be labeled that or anything else. I don't, I don't want to. I, I, I don't want to be labeled that. But you know what? The first thing I run to is the great physician. If I don't have to take it, I won't take it. If I don't feel like I need it, I won't do it. But if I feel like I need it, I'll do it. You, you, you hear what I'm saying? I'm not anti-medicine, but a lot of times we put our trust in a vaccine. Oh, did I say that? Uh oh, we put our trust in the things of man. And I, if you got a vaccine, it's okay. I'm not. I don't have anything against that. That's not my point here today. My point today is that even as the writer of Psalm said, I will put my trust in Him. Why? Because men will fail you. Systems will fail you, science will fail you, medical stuff will fail you, but God will never fail you. He will never fail you, ever fail you. He is faithful. And the writer said this if you will dwell in the secret place, the secret place of His Word, not many people want the Word anymore. Many people just want you to, Pastor, tickle my ears and tell me how I can have a good marriage. The way to have a good marriage is get in the presence of the Lord. How can I get this off of me? What's my next step? Your step and your only step is to get in the presence of the Lord and hear what God says by the Spirit of the Lord because He knows all things and He created you, formed you, and fashioned you, and He is the key to your breakthrough. He is the key to your miracle. He is the key to the sign and wonder that you may need. He is the key to all things in life. My God, my fortress, in who? In Him I will trust. So there's nothing wrong with medication. There's nothing wrong with those things. You be led by the Spirit of the Lord, but your trust is in Him. Because what do the world want to do? Hey, if you'll just do this, and if you'll just do that. If you'll just do this, if you'll just do that. There's, there, there's knowledge and there's wisdom, but the greatest wisdom of all comes from above. Getting in the pool and staying in the pool of His presence in the secret place, in the Spirit, is the key to, a vi to victory. 
So Psalms 91 says, he who dwells, say it with me again, dwells. Dwells means to remain, to keep the attention directed. Did you get that? Dwell means this. It means to remain and keep the attention directed. The attention has to be constantly directed to what God says about you and your situation. And you know what's you know what's sad is many Christians don't know what God says about their marriage, don't know what God says about their health, does not go what God says about their finances, does not go know what God says about their future. Everything is just kind of up in the air to chance. But I'm here to tell you, God has already predestined a plan for you. He's already made a way for you. And if we will dwell, if we will remain, if we will keep the attention directed on the author and the finisher of our faith, if we will look to Jesus, because when we look to everything else. What does it do? It tries to fill us with fear. And the Bible says fear has torment. He says if you dwell, then you shall what? Abide. Abide means to remain stable. Stable. To remain stable or fixed in a state. To continue in a place to conform to. Do not be conformed to the world, but be transformed, Romans 12, 1 and 2, by the renewing of your mind. Do not be conformed to the world, the pattern of the world, the lies of the enemy. Because you know what? If you believe a lie, you will live a lie. And the lie becomes a truth to people. They believe the lie that, you know what? Everybody going to get sick? I guess I'll get sick. This is going to happen to everybody? I guess it's going to happen to me. You know what? People even say, well, my daddy went through this. My mama went through this. My grandpa went through this. I'm probably going to go through this. That's why the doctors ask you all your medical history. Can I tell you something? By the blood of the Lamb... Every curse that was in your lineage can be broken by the words spoken over your mouth, through your mouth. Death and life are in the power of the tongue. But what do we do? We just accept the fleshly, the worldly way. We, we accept the fallen world. We accept the curse that the blood has already redeemed us from. And the curse comes and it tries, to, it tries to be formed in our life and attach itself to us. But what we have to do is get back in the spirit. We've got to get back in the secret place, the word of God. And we've got to resist the things that are a part of the curse. Well, I did that a few times. I said this last week. I did that a few times and it didn't work. Well, the, dev- the, the devil's going to the devil's gonna try to outlast you, and you've got to outlast the devil. You've got to keep on keeping on. The Bible says in the book of Ephesians that when you've done all to stand, you've got to keep standing. And you want to be standing in the presence. You want to be standing in the spirit. You want to be standing in the pool. You want to be standing and dwelling and abiding in the secret place of the Word of God. That what God's Word says is true. That God's Word speaks a better word than any other word. And I know I may feel this and I may see this and chaos may be going on around me. But let me tell you something. Nothing on the outside will change till it's changed on the inside. And when you get it on the inside, of you, you will stand and not be moved. You will say, on Christ the solid rock I stand, all other ground is seeking sand. But you know what we do? Well, I guess it's just going to happen that way. And I'm this old now. So now that I'm this old and I realize this fleshly body, some of us are ready for our new glorified resurrected body. I understand that. But you know what you got to do? You got to take care of your temple. And one way to take care of your temple is keep speaking life over it instead of death. You can't be saying, well, I guess I'm just losing in my mind and my memory is not as good anymore. No, you got to stand on the word of God that says the memory of the righteous is blessed. But the flesh says, oh, this is happening. That's happening. All these things are happening. Am I in the right house this morning? I got to hurry up. When we don't dwell, when we don't remain, when we don't abide, we are unstable. We're back and forth. We're back and forth. One minute we're in church. Man, I'm making a commitment to the Lord. I'm going to pray. I'm going to get prayer. And the next week we're just back where we were before. Oh, we got to run back. But keep running to the Father. Just keep on running to Him. I'm glad that people do. But we got to get in this place that we are, uh, we are stable and we are founded upon the rock, the Word of the living God. And when we don't dwell, remain, and abide, we become unstable. And when we don't trust in the word and the promises of God, we're actually double-minded. The Bible says in the book of James, I'm going to read these quick. The book of James, chapter 1, verse 6 through 8. But let him who ask in faith. He was talking about wisdom right before this. But let him who ask, ask in faith with no doubting. For he who doubts is like a wave of the sea, driven and tossed by the wind. For let not that man suppose that he will receive anything from the Lord. Hmm. 
He is double-minded man, unstable in all of his ways. Unstable in all of his ways. Why? Because one minute we are in the Word, the next minute we're in the flesh. One minute we're in the Spirit, the next minute we're in the flesh. Happens to us all the time. Happened this morning to me. I had to make a conscious decision, as Johnny said, we've got to get in the pool. Oh, I'm getting, I'm getting out of the pool right here. I'm getting, I'm getting in a place that I don't really need to be, and I'm, I'm about to give you a piece of my mind. I'm about to just tell you like it is. But no, I've got to stay in the pool. I've got to speak according to the Word of God. I've got to speak grace. I've got to speak truth. The truth hurts sometimes, but I've got to speak the truth. I've got to, I got to do what God says. Why? I can't, be, I can't be unstable in all of my ways. If we're double-minded, who thinks that he will receive anything from the Lord? The place to receive is in the place of the Word and the Spirit of God. Walking in the Spirit, not fulfilling the lust of the flesh. Double-mindedness is ungodliness. Double-mindedness is ungodliness, and ungodliness is unrighteousness. But we have been made right in the image of God when we step into the pool of His presence and His Spirit, when we choose the Word over our flesh and put our flesh under. But when we become double-minded and we say, well, I don't know if that's really going to work or I don't know if that's really for me, then we're double-minded and we're not really trusting in the Word of God. Why? Because we don't see it. We don't feel it. We don't think it's happening or anything else. And the enemy will try to make us feel that way to get us off the promise of God because he who stands in that place of righteousness with God. But when we become double-minded, we are under godly we're not walking in the godly place in the godly place of the spirit in the presence of the lord where all blessings and abundance and healing flow we're over here in our flesh and when we're over here in our flesh we are not walking in godliness we let no flesh even glory in his presence we are we are walking in ungodliness and in unrighteousness and there is a powerful point of staying in the pool of righteousness that I'm in right standing with God because of the blood of the Lamb, not because of what I've done. Those who stay in the pool of righteousness are blessed. The Bible tells us in Proverbs 10, 6 and 7, blessed blessings are on the head of the righteous. Blessings are on the head of the righteous. Do you know why it says head? Because everything blows, flows from the head. Everything flows from the head. That's why you should want your pastor blessed beyond measure. You should want your pastor blessed beyond measure. Why? Because everything flows from the head. If I'm blessed, you're going to be blessed. And I am blessed. You hear what I'm saying? I am blessed. I'm so blessed. I'm, 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 I'm blessed beyond measure. I'm blessed. He says this, blessings are on the head of the righteous, but violence covers the mouth of the wicked. Listen, verse 7, the memory of the righteous is blessed, but the name of the wicked will rot. Mm. The memory of the righteous is blessed. The enemy will try to tell you you're losing your mind. This is happening and that's happening. But you know what? Dwelling and abiding and remaining is not just believing. It's action. It's action, church. And i got to hurry and close with this. But it is action. It is obedience. Dwelling, remaining, abiding is a conscious decision that we learned a couple of weeks ago of getting in the pool. It is an action. It is taking that step. It is putting that flesh under. It is obedience. Somebody shout obedience. It is obedience in worship. Some of you need to learn to get your praise and worship on. That's a whole nother sermon. It's obedience in the word. It's in obedience in living. It's obedience in our giving. Jesus said this in John 15 and 7. If you abide in me and my words in you, you will ask what you desire and it shall be done for you. We read over that. We just skip over that. Well, that worked for somebody. That didn't work for me. No, it'll work for you. It'll work for you. It will work for you if you will keep working it, if you will keep believing it, if you will keep being obedient and worship the word and living. So how do we actively abide and remain and dwell? Number one, we got to meditate. Somebody shout it with me. Meditate. You've got to meditate on his promises. You've got you've to listen to the word more than you listen to the news. I'm just going to go ahead and say it. Some of us listen to the news, and we, know, we, we, can, we can quote the news, and we can quote sometimes even our favorite preachers more than we can quote Jesus. Meditate on the Word. 
Listen to the word continually, constantly. That's how you remain. That's how you abide. That's where the blessings of the Lord are in our life. The Bible says this in Colossians 3, 1 through 3. If then you were raised with Christ, seek those things which are above. Seek what? Those things that are above. That means kingdom things, heavenly things, spiritual things. If you then were raised with Christ, seek those things which are above where Christ is sitting at the, sitting at the right hand of God. Verse number two, verse number two says, set your mind, set your mind, seek and set, seek and set, set your mind on the things above, not on the things of the earth. There is so much liberation if we could just do these two things right here. There's so many things that we have paid multiple millions probably for research and counsel and and things. And thank God for research and thank God for counselors and therapists and everything else. But you know what? The greatest therapy is the Word of God. The greatest answer is the Word of God. And he says if we would do these things, if if we would set, we've got to meditate on the promises, set our mind on the promises of God. And we've got to seek Those things that are above. You know how you seek? Through worship and through prayer. I want to read this really quickly, and I'm really closing with the Scripture. Somebody said amen. I'm really closing with the Scripture. And I want to read it in the Passion Translation. It's Colossians chapter 3, verse number 1. These that I just read, I want to read it to you again in the Passion Translation. Christ's resurrection is your resurrection too. This thing is personal. This thing of freedom and victory is personal. It's not for a few pastors or somebody that's been to Bible school. No, Christ's resurrection is your resurrection too. This is why we are to yearn for all that is where? Above. For that's where Christ sits enthroned at the place of all power, honor, and authority. He says we are to yearn. If, it, if it's Christ's resurrection, it's our resurrection too. This is why we are to yearn for all the things that are above. What are we to be yearning for? The things that are above. Come on, our flesh. Some of y'all hungry right now. you just yearning for a cheeseburger. You know what I mean? Like, hurry up, man. I got to get the Longhorn real quick. They're already seeking people. It says... The things that are above, yearn for those things. Where Christ is enthroned at the place of all power, honor, and authority. Yes, feast on all the treasures of the heavenly realm. Feast on all the treasures of where? The heavenly realm. And fill your thoughts with heavenly realities. That's so powerful. The redemptive realities of the word of God. The the world will try to talk you out of the realities of the kingdom, the realities of God. But what we need to do is begin to mature and begin to walk in the spirit and not fulfill the lust of the flesh. And we need to feast on all the treasures of the heavenly realm and fill your thoughts with heavenly realities and not with the distractions of the natural realm. Everything in the natural realm is a distraction. Your crucifixion with, with Christ has served the tie has severed the tie to this life, and now your true life is hidden away in God in Christ Jesus. When we come up out of the pool, what do we do? We come, out, we come up out of this place of the secret place that Psalms 91 is telling us, and we get over here in the realm of the flesh, and the enemy don't even have any power. But what he does, I heard a pastor say this one time, he takes a hammer and he hits you over the head, and then you usually pick the hammer up and keep hitting yourself in the head. He don't have to do anything else. Why? Because we're over here in the earthly realm when we're created to walk in the realm of the Spirit. Your crucifixion was with Christ and has has severed the tie to this life, and now your true life is hidden away in God and Christ. And as Christ himself is seen from who he really is, who you really are will also be revealed. For you are now one with him in his glory. Live as one who has died to every form of sexual sin and impurity, live as one who has died to the desires of forbidden things, including the desires for wealth. Mm. Why? Because it's a distraction. God wants you wealthy, but in his way, which is the essence of idol worship. When you live in these vices, you ignite the anger. When you live in these vices, 
Man, how many of us have just felt pressured and squeezed by the things that have happened over the last couple of years? We have all felt the vices of the flesh and the natural realm. But if we can learn to get in the pool, if we can learn to stay in the realm of the Spirit, if we can do that by meditating on His Word, by seeking Him, by going above and beyond the natural realm and stepping into the spiritual realm... He says, live as the one who has died from those sexual sins and purities. Live as one who has died to the desires of the the forbidden things, including the desires of wealth, which is the essence of idol worship. When you live in these vices, you ignite the anger of God against these acts of disobedience. That's how you once behaved, characterized by your evil deeds. But now it's time to eliminate them from your lives once and for all. Anger, fits of rage, all forms of hatred, cursing, filthy speech, and lying. Laying aside the old Adam self. Laying, uh, laying aside the old man and the old way oh, with its masquerade of, of, of disguises. For you have acquired new creation life, which is continually being renewed into the likeness of the one who created you. Giving you the full revelation of God. In this creation life, your, your, your national, nationality makes no difference, nor your ethnic, eth, eth, ethnicity makes any difference, education, nor your economical status. He's saying none of this stuff in the natural realm makes a difference. Yes, you have to work to eat. We understand that. Your kids need to go to school. You have responsibilities in this earth, but we've got to learn to live from the place of the Spirit of God and the Word of God. Why? Because when we do that, things over here begin to line up and things begin to flow in a different way that, 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 that many times we try to make happen on our own but it is not by might nor by power, but it's by my spirit, saith the Lord. I lost my place. Understand, other, be compassionate. You are always, uh, you, you are always and dearly loved by God. So robe yourself with the virtues of God since you have been divinely chosen to be holy. Oh, we can't talk about holiness in church no more. We can't talk about holiness and obedience. And he says, be merciful. As you endeavor, he says, yes, endeavor to understand others and be compassionate, showing kindness toward all. Be gentle and humble, unoffendable in your patience with others. Unoffendable? (laughs) Unoffendable? We get offended at the traffic light. (laughs) Jesus said, if you can be, you will be offended. It's not that offenses are not going to come. It's what you do with them. Tolerate the weakness of those in the family of faith, forgiving one another in the same way you have been graciously forgiven by Jesus Christ. If you find fault with someone, release this same gift of forgiveness to them. What would happen in the church of God? What would happen in the people of God? What would happen with pastors in this community if we could just love each other and not be in competition with each other and worry about you going to steal my sheep or their sheep and they ain't even our sheep anyway. They're the Lord's sheep. We're part of a kingdom anyway. For love is supreme and must flow through each of these virtues. Love becomes the mark of true maturity. Maturity. 